My Man Jeeves by P. G. Wodehouse. 4. Absent Treatment I want to tell you all about my dear old Bobby Cardew. It's a most interesting story. I can't put in any literary style and all that, but I don't have to, don't you know, because it goes on its moral lesson. If you're a man, you mustn't miss it, because it'll be a warning to you. And if you're a woman, you won't want to, because it's all about how a girl made a man feel pretty well fed up with things. If you're a recent acquaintance of Bobby's, you'll probably be surprised to hear that there was a time when he was more remarkable for the weakness of his memory than anything else. Dozens of fellows who have only met Bobby once since the change took place have been surprised when I told them that. Yes, it's true. Believe me. In the days when I first knew him, Bobby Cardew was about the most pronounced young rotter inside the four-mile radius. People have called me a silly ass, but I was never in the same class with Bobby. When it came to being a silly ass, he was a plus-four man, while my handicap was about six. Why, if I wanted him to dine with me, I used to post him a letter at the beginning of the week, and then the day before send him a telegram and a phone call on the day itself, and, half an hour before the time we'd fixed, a messenger in a taxi, whose business it was to see that he got in and that the chauffeur had the address all correct. By doing this, I generally managed to get him, unless he had left town before my messenger arrived. The funny thing was that he wasn't altogether a fool in other ways. Deep down in him, there was a kind of stratum of sense. I had known him, once or twice, show an almost human intelligence. But to reach that stratum, mind you, you needed dynamite. At least, that's what I thought. But there was another way which hadn't occurred to me. Marriage, I mean. Marriage, the dynamite of the soul. That was what hit Bobby. He married. Have you ever seen a bull pup chasing a bee? The pup sees the bee. It looks good to him. But he still doesn't know what's at the end of it till he gets there. It was like that with Bobby. He fell in love, got married with a sort of whoop, as if it were the greatest fun in the world, and then began to find out things. She wasn't the sort of girl you would have expected Bobby to rave about, and yet, I don't know, what I mean is, she worked for her living, and to a fellow who has never done a hand's turn in his life, there's undoubtedly a sort of fascination, a kind of romance about a girl who works for her living. Her name was Anthony, Mary Anthony. She was about five feet six. She had a ton and a half of red-gold hair, gray eyes, and one of those determined chins. She was a hospital nurse. When Bobby smashed himself up at Polo, she was told off by the authorities to smooth his brow and rally round with cooling unguents and all like that. And the old boy hadn't been up and about again for more than a week before they'd popped off to the Red Stars and fixed it up. Quite the romance. Bobby broke the news to me at the club one evening, and the next day he introduced me to her. I admired her. I've never worked myself. My name's Pepper, by the way. Almost forgot to mention it. Reggie Pepper. My Uncle Edward was Pepper Wells and Company, the colliery people. He left me a sizable chunk of bullion. I say I've never worked myself, but I admire anyone who earns a living under difficulties, especially a girl and this girl had a rather unusual time of it, being an orphan and all that, and having had to do everything off her own bat for years. Mary and I got along splendidly. We don't now, but we'll come to that later. I'm speaking of the past. She seemed to think Bobby the greatest thing on earth, judging by the way she looked at him when she thought I wasn't noticing, and Bobby seemed to think the same about her. So that I came to the conclusion that, if only dear old Bobby didn't forget to go to the wedding, they had a sporting chance of being quite happy. Well, let's brisk it up a bit here and jump a year. The story doesn't really start till then. They took a flat and settled down. I was in and out of the place quite a good deal. I kept my eyes open, and everything seemed to me to be running along as smoothly as you could want. If this was marriage, I thought, 
I couldn't see why fellows were so frightened of it. There were a lot worse things that could happen to a man. But we now come to the incident of the quiet dinner. And it's just here that love's young dream hits a snag, and things begin to occur. I happened to meet Bobby in Piccadilly, and he asked me to come back to dinner at the flat. And, like a fool, instead of bolting and putting myself under police protection, I went. When we got to the flat, there was Mrs. Bobby looking, well, I tell you, it staggered me. Her gold hair was all piled up in waves and crinkles and things, with a what-you-call-it of diamonds in it, and she was wearing the most perfectly ripping dress. I couldn't begin to describe it. I can only say it was the limit. It struck me that if this was how she was in the habit of looking every night when they were dining quietly at home together, it was no wonder that Bobby liked domesticity. "'Here's old Reggie, dear,' said Bobby. "'I brought him home to have a bit of dinner. I'll phone down to the kitchen and ask them to send it up now, what?' She stared at him as if she had never seen him before. Then she turned scarlet. Then she turned white as a sheet. Then she gave a little laugh. It was most interesting to watch. Made me wish I was up a tree about eight hundred miles away. Then she recovered herself. "'I'm so glad you were able to come, Mr. Pepper,' she said, smiling at me. And after that she was all right. At least you would have said so. She talked a lot at dinner and chafed Bobby and played us ragtime on the piano afterwards, as if she hadn't a care in the world. Quite a jolly little party it was. Not. I'm no lynx-eyed sleuth and all that sort of thing, but I had seen her face at the beginning, and I knew that she was working the whole time and working hard to keep herself in hand, and that she would have given that diamond what's-its-name in her hair and everything else she possessed to have one good scream, just one. I've sat through some pretty thick evenings in my time, but that one had the rest beaten in a canter. At the very earliest moment I grabbed my hat and got away. Having seen what I did, I wasn't particularly surprised to meet Bobby at the club next day, looking about as merry and bright as a lonely gumdrop at an Eskimo tea party. We started in straight away. He seemed glad to have someone to talk about it. "'Do you know how long I've been married?' he said. "'I didn't, exactly. "'About a year, isn't it?' "'Not about a year,' he said sadly. "'Exactly a year. "'Yesterday.' "'Then I understood. "'I saw a light, a regular flash of light. "'Yesterday was the anniversary of the wedding. "'I'd arranged to take Mary to the Savoy and on to Covent Garden.' She particularly wanted to hear Caruso. I had the ticket for the box in my pocket. Do you know, all through dinner I had a kind of rummy idea that there was something I'd forgotten, but I couldn't think what. Till your wife mentioned it? He nodded. She mentioned it, he said thoughtfully. I didn't ask for details. Women with hair and chins like Mary's may be angels most of the time, but when they take off their wings for a bit, they aren't half-hearted about it. To be absolutely frank, old top, said poor old Bobby, in a broken sort of way, my stock's pretty low at home. There didn't seem much to be done. I just lit a cigarette and sat there. He didn't want to talk. Presently he went out. I stood at the window of our upper smoking-room, which looks out onto Piccadilly, and watched him. He walked slowly along for a few yards, stopped, then walked on again, and finally turned into a jeweler's. Which is an instant of what I mean when I say that deep down in him there was a certain stratum of sense. It was from now on that I began to be really interested in this problem of Bobby's married life. Of course, one's always mildly interested in one's friends' marriages, hoping they'll turn out well and all that, but this was different. The average man isn't like Bobby, and the average girl isn't like Mary. It was like that old business of the immovable mass and the irresistible force. There was Bobby, ambling gently through life, a dear old chap in a hundred ways, 
but undoubtedly a chump of the first water. And there was Mary, determined that he shouldn't be a chump. And nature, mind you, on Bobby's side. When nature makes a chump like dear old Bobby, she's proud of him, and doesn't want her handiwork disturbed. She gives him a sort of natural armor to protect him against outside interference. And that armor is shortness of memory. Shortness of memory keeps a man a chump, when, but for it, he might cease to be one. Take my case, for instance. I'm a chump. Well, if I had remembered half the things people have tried to teach me during my life, my size in hats would be about number nine. But I didn't. I forgot them. And it was just the same with Bobby. For about a week, perhaps a bit more, the recollection of that quiet little domestic evening bucked him up like a tonic. Elephants, I read somewhere, are champions at the memory business, but they were fools to Bobby during that week. But, bless you, the shock wasn't nearly big enough. It had dented the armor, but it hadn't made a hole in it. Pretty soon he was back at the old game. It was pathetic, don't you know? The poor girl loved him, and she was frightened. It was the thin edge of the wedge, you see, and she knew it. A man who forgets what day he was married, when he's been married one year, will forget, at about the end of the fourth, that he's married at all. If she meant to get him in hand at all, she had got to do it now, before he began to drift away. I saw that clearly enough, and I tried to make Bobby see it, when he was by way of pouring out his troubles to me one afternoon. I can't remember what it was that he had forgotten the day before, but it was something she had asked him to bring home for her. It may have been a book. It's such a little thing to fuss about, said Bobby, and she knows it simply because I've got such an infernal memory about everything. I can't remember anything. Never could. He talked on for a while, and just as he was going, he pulled out a couple of sovereigns. Oh, by the way, he said, what's this for, I asked, though I knew. I owe it to you. How's that, I said. Why, that bet on Tuesday. In the billiard room? Murray and Brown were playing a hundred up, and I gave you two to one that Brown would win, and Murray beat him by twenty odd. So you do remember some things, I said. He got quite excited, said that if I thought he was the sort of rotter who forgot to pay when he lost a bet, it was pretty rotten of me after knowing him all these years, and a lot more like that. Subside, laddie, I said. Then I spoke to him like a father. What you've got to do, my old college chum, I said, is to pull yourself together, and jolly quick, too. As things are shaping, you're due for a nasty knock before you know what's hit you. You've got to make an effort. Don't say you can't. This two-quid business shows that, even if your memory is rocky, you can remember some things. What you've got to do is to see that wedding anniversaries and so on are included on the list. It may be a brain strain, but you can't get out of it. I suppose you're right, said Bobby, but it beats me why she thinks such a lot of these rotten little dates. What's it matter if I forgot what day we were married on, or what day she was born on, or, or what day the cat had the measles? She knows I love her just as much as if I were a memorizing freak at the halls. That's not enough for a woman, I said. They want to be shown. Bear that in mind, and you'll be all right. Forget it, and there'll be trouble. He chewed the knob of his stick. Women are frightfully rummy, he said gloomily. You should have thought of that before you married one, I said. I don't see that I could have done any more. I'd put the whole thing in a nutshell for him. You would have thought he would have seen the point, and that it would have made him brace up and get a hold of himself. But no. Off he went again in the same old way. I gave up arguing with him. I had a good deal of time on my hands, but not enough to amount to anything when it was a question of reforming dear old Bobby by argument. If you see a man asking for trouble, and insisting on getting it, the only thing to do is to stand by and wait till it comes to him. After that, you may get a chance. But till then, there's nothing to be done. But 
I thought a lot about him. Bobby didn't get into the soup all at once. Weeks went by, and months, and still nothing happened. Now and then he'd come into the club with a kind of cloud on his shiny morning face, and I'd known that there had been doings in the home, but it wasn't till well on in the spring that he got the thunderbolt, just where he'd been asking for it, in the thorax. I was smoking a quiet cigarette one morning on the window looking out over Piccadilly, and watching the buses and motors going up one way and down the other. Most interesting it is, I often do it, when in rushed Bobby, with his eyes bulging and his face the color of an oyster, waving a piece of paper in his hand. "'Reggie,' he said. "'Reggie, old top, she's gone.' "'Gone,' I said. "'Who?' "'Mary, of course. Gone. Left me. Gone.' "'Where?' I said. "'Silly question. Perhaps you're right. Anyhow, dear old Bobby nearly foamed at the mouth. "'Where?' How should I know where? Here, read this. He pushed the paper into my hand. It was a letter. Go on, said Bobby. Read it. So I did. It certainly was quite a letter. There was not much of it, but it was all to the point. This is what it said. My dear Bobby, I am going away. When you care enough about me to remember to wish me many happy returns on my birthday, I will come back. My address will be Box 341, London Morning News. I read it twice. Then I said, Well, why don't you? Why don't I what? Why don't you wish her many happy returns? It doesn't seem much to ask. But she says on her birthday. Well, when is her birthday? Can't you understand, said Bobby. I've forgotten. Forgotten, I said. Yes, said Bobby, forgotten. What do you mean, forgotten, I said. Forgotten whether it's the 20th or the 21st, or what? How near do you get to it? I know it came somewhere between the 1st of January and the 31st of December. That's how near I get to it. Think. Think? What's the use of saying think? Think I haven't thought? I've been knocking sparks out of my brain ever since I opened that letter. And you can't remember? No. I rang the bell and ordered restoratives. Well, Bobby, I said, it's a pretty hard case to spring on an untrained amateur like me. Suppose someone had come to Sherlock Holmes and said, Mr. Holmes, here's a case for you. When is my wife's birthday? Wouldn't that have given Sherlock a jolt? However, I know enough about the game to understand that a fellow can't shoot off his deductive theories unless you start him with a clue. So rouse yourself out of that pop-eyed trance and come across with two or three. For instance, can't you remember the last time she had a birthday? What sort of weather was it? That might fix the month. Bobby shook his head. It was just ordinary weather, as near as I can recollect. Warm? Warmish? Or cold? Well... Well, fairly cold, I perhaps. I can't remember. I ordered two more of the same. They seemed indicated in the young detective's manual. You're a great help, Bobby, I said. An invaluable assistant. One of those indispensable adjuncts without which no home is complete. Bobby seemed to be thinking. I've got it, he said suddenly. Look here. I gave her a present on her last birthday. All we have to do is go to the shop, hunt up the date when it was bought, and the thing's done. Absolutely. What did you give her? He sagged. I can't remember, he said. Getting ideas is like golf. Some days you're right off. Others, it's as easy as falling off a log. I don't suppose dear old Bobby had ever had two ideas in the same morning before in his life but now he did it without an effort. He just loosed another dry martini into the undergrowth, and before you could turn around, it had flushed quite a brain wave. Do you know those little books called When You Were Born? There's one for each month. They tell you your character, your talents, your strong points, and your weak points at four pence halfpenny a go. Bobby's idea was to buy the whole twelve 
and go through them till we found out which month hit off Mary's character. That would give us the month, and narrow it down a whole lot. A pretty hot idea for a non-thinker like dear old Bobby. We sallied out at once. He took half, and I took half, and we settled down to work. As I say, it sounded good, but when we came into the thing, we saw that there was a flaw. There was plenty of information, all right, but there wasn't a single month that didn't have something that exactly hit off Mary. For instance, in the December book it said, December people are apt to keep their own secrets. They are extensive travelers. Well, Mary had certainly kept her secret, and she had traveled quite extensively enough for Bobby's needs. Then October people were born with original ideas and loved moving. You couldn't have summed up Mary's little jaunt more neatly. February people had wonderful memories. Mary's speciality. We took a bit of a rest, then had another go at the thing. Bobby was all for May, because the book said that women born in that month were inclined to be capricious, which is always a barrier to a happy married life. But I plumped for February, because February women are unusually determined to have their own way, are very earnest, and expect a full return in their companion or mates. Which he owned was about as like Mary as anything could be. In the end he tore the books up, stamped on them, burnt them, and went home. It was wonderful what a change the next few days made in dear old Bobby. Have you ever seen that picture, The Soul's Awakening? It represents a flapper of sorts, gazing in a startled sort of way into the middle distance, with a look in her eyes that seems to say, Surely that is George's step I hear on the mat. Can this be love? Well, Bobby had a soul's awakening, too. I don't suppose he had ever troubled to think in his life before, not really think. But now he was wearing his brain to the bone. It was painful in a way, of course, to see a fellow human being so thoroughly in the soup, and I felt strongly that it was all for the best. I could see as plainly as possible that all these brainstorms were improving Bobby out of knowledge. When it was all over, he might possibly become a rotter again of a sort, but it would only be a pale reflection of the rotter he had been. It bore out the idea I had always had that what he needed was a really good jolt. I saw a great deal of him these days. I was his best friend, and he came to me for sympathy. I gave it to him, too, with both hands, but I never failed to hand him the moral lesson when I had him weak. One day he came to me as I was sitting in the club, and I could see that he had had an idea. He looked happier than he'd done in weeks. "'Reggie,' he said, "'I'm on the trail. This time I'm convinced that I shall pull it off. I've remembered something of vital importance.' "'Yes,' I said. "'I remember distinctly,' he said, "'that on Mary's last birthday we went together to the Colosseum. How does that hit you?' It's a fine bit of memorizing, I said, but how does it help? Why, they change the program every week there. Ah, I said, now you're talking. And the week we went, one of the turns was Professor Someone's Tripsichorean Cats. I recollect them distinctly. Now, are we narrowing it down, or aren't we, Reggie? I'm going round to the Colosseum this minute and I'm going to dig the date of those Terpsichorean cats out of them if I have to use a crowbar. So that got him within six days, for the management treated us like brothers, brought out the archives, and ran agile fingers over the pages till they treed the cats in the middle of May. I told you it was May, said Bobby. Maybe you'll listen to me another time. If you've any sense, I said, there won't be another time. And Bobby said that there wouldn't. Once you get your money on the run, it parts as if it enjoyed doing it. I had just got off to sleep that night when my telephone bell rang. It was Bobby, of course. He didn't apologize. Reggie, he said, I've got it now for certain. It's just come to me. We saw those Terpsichorean cats at a matinee, old man. Yes, I said. Well, don't you see that that brings it down to two days? It must have been either Wednesday the 7th or Saturday the 10th. Yes, I said, if they didn't have daily matinees at the Coliseum. 
I heard him give a sort of howl. Bobby, I said. My feet were freezing, but I was fond of him. Well, I've remembered something, too. It's this. The day you went to the Coliseum, I lunched with you both at the Ritz. You had forgotten to bring any money with you, so you wrote a check. But I'm always writing checks. You are, but this was for a tenor, and made out to the hotel. Hunt up your checkbook and see how many checks for ten pounds payable to the Ritz Hotel you wrote out between May the 5th and May the 10th. He gave a kind of gulp. Reggie, he said, you're a genius. I've always said so. I believe you've got it. Hold the line. Presently he came back again. Hello, he said. I'm here, I said. It was the 8th. Reggie, old man, I... Topping, I said. Good night. It was working along into the small hours now, but I thought I might as well make a night of it and finish the thing up, so I rang up an hotel near the Strand. Put me through to Mrs. Cardew, I said. It's late, said the man at the other end. And getting later every minute, I said. Buck along, laddie. I waited patiently. I had missed my beauty sleep, and my feet had frozen hard, but I was past regrets. "'What is the matter?' said Mary's voice. "'My feet are cold,' I said, but I didn't call you up to tell you that particularly. I've just been chatting with Bobby, Mrs. Cardew. "'Oh, is that Mr. Pepper?' "'Yes. He's remembered it, Mrs. Cardew.' She gave a sort of scream. I've often thought how interesting it must be to be one of those exchange girls. The things they must hear, don't you know? Bobby's howl and gulp and Mrs. Bobby's scream and all about my feet and all that. Most interesting it must be. He's remembered it, she gasped. Did you tell him? No. Well, I hadn't. Mr. Pepper? Yes. Was he... has he been... was he very worried? I chuckled. This was where I was billed to be the life and soul of the party. Worried? He was about the most worried man between here and Edinburgh. He has been worrying as if he was paid to do it by the nation. He has started out to worry after breakfast, and, oh, well, you can never tell with women. My idea was that we should pass the rest of the night slapping each other on the back across the wire, and telling each other what bally brainy conspirators we were, don't you know, and all that. But I had got just as far as this when she bit at me. Absolutely. I heard the snap. And then she said, Oh, in that choked kind of way. And when a woman says, Oh, like that, it means all the bad words she loved to say, if she only knew them. And then she began. What brutes men are! What horrible brutes! How could you stand by and see poor dear Bobby worrying himself into a fever when a word from you would have put everything right? I can't, but, and you call yourself his friend, his friend, metallic laugh, most unpleasant. It shows how one can be deceived. I used to think you a kind-hearted man. But, I say, when I suggested the thing you thought it perfectly, I thought it hateful, abominable. But you said it was absolutely top. I said nothing of the kind, and if I did, I didn't mean it. I don't wish to be unjust, Mr. Pepper, but I must say that to me there seems to be something positively fiendish in a man who could go out of his way to separate a husband from his wife, simply in order to amuse himself by gloating over his agony. But when one single word would have— But you made me promise not to, I bleated. And if I did, do you suppose I didn't expect you to have the sense to break your promise? I had finished. I had no further observations to make. I hung up the receiver and crawled into bed. I still see Bobby when he comes to the club, but I do not visit the old homestead. He is friendly, but he stops short of issuing invitations. I ran across Mary at the academy last week, and her eyes went through me like a couple of bullets through a pat of butter, and as they came out the other side, and I limped off to piece myself together again, there occurred to me the simple epitaph which, when I am no more, I intend to have inscribed on my tombstone. It was this. He was a man who acted from the best motives. There is one born every minute. End of Absent Treatment